Sir, the noise goes to that. I'm going to ask the player to mistake of the record of the noise. The lecture is from this one, these two Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, Ora Pernobis, Pecatoricus, Lucre Noa Mortis Nostri, Amen. Please be seated. On this first Friday of the month of May, we'll continue our series explaining the ceremonies of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We're now in part 23, the communion contents. With hands outstretched, the priest proceeds with the communion contents. At the name Maria, he inclines his head to the missal at the Jesu Christi towards the cross. And at the close of the prayer, preemdom, he joins his hands. In the light of what we have gained already from our study of the Mass, it should be easy to grasp the meaning of the communion contents. One thing is clear about this part of the Mass. In it, we are coming into close touch with heaven. Communion contents means getting into communication with the saints in glory. To eyes of faith, the divine spectacle presents itself as the liturgy rises steadily toward the climax of the consecration. We peer into that which lies beyond, while in undertones of quiet gravity, the priest recites the communion contents. There is a new scene upon which the keen vision of faith dwells. Suddenly we are brought into the company of the elect. A stately procession passes before our soul's eyes. Mary, the Mother of God, the Apostles, the Martyrs, and Confessors, and we are put into communication with all the saints who stand before the throne of God. In the Mass, our Lord Jesus Christ draws all to himself as a common center. He is, in all believers, and it is through him that they are what they are, members of the body of Christ. In order to conceive the part we play in the drama of Calvary, painstaking consideration should be given to the vital truth of the mystical body and our role therein. By, our, by union of our intention, we make our Lord's great acts of praise, prayer, reparation, and obedience our own. Our Lord made this plain when he said, quote, I am the vine, you are the branches. He is indeed the head, we are the members of this mystical body. The whole Christ is head and body. The head, the only begotten Son of God, and his body, the church all his members on earth, in purgatory, and in heaven. Our Lord receives his full completion in being united with all of us, his members. Therefore, the church is called the complement of Christ, just as the body com completes the head, or the crew completes the ship, or the nave, the choir of the church. But let's go back to the divine idea which is our blessed Lord's own teaching. As the branches make the vine's light their own, and make their, their own the fruit of the vine, so we, being in close touch with the vine, by our presence at Mass, by our union with Christ, by sanctifying grace, assist in the great drama to God's honor and glory, as well as for the good of our own soul. We are not the only ones in church at Mass time. Besides those who kneel with us, there are other guests at the sacred sacrifice, others united with us. Those are they whom we see not with the eye of the body, but rather with the eye of the soul. In the divine drama, which a church enacts around the altar, they have due place. The church visualizes them for us. She wants, wants us to make of them real friends. So they are summoned before us. With them we communicate, 
them also we commemorate. And who are they? All those who in the, in the past have received and believed in our Lord. With them we now join and participate in their praise, prayer, and thanksgiving. We unite our intentions with theirs. Now indeed we are no more strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and domestics of God, as St. Paul Epistle to Ephesians 2.19 says. Being united in communion with the saints, let us try to live and think in the infinite in order that we may appreciate what it is to be members of the household of the faith, sharing in common with the, with the saints. The communion contest places us in wish, in faith, in reality, with our brethren in sainthood. The great names flipped Past like palaces on a river brink, their vases washed by the pouring liturgy. In a single sentence, rippling with light and glory, they move before us. One by one, we meet them, are introduced to them. Glorious and ever blessed Virgin Mary, the blessed apostles and martyrs, and all the saints. Someday we shall see them face to face. But now, their fair forms appear in the fields and spreading courts of faith. It is all just like a little glimpse of heaven, a life with God, and near at hand, his holy saints, our brethren. Of the helpfulness of this intercession, prayer, human contest, there can be no doubt. It is time then that we should stir up our consciousness of the communion of saints and tune our hearts to their songs of light. Look over the list of those who have holy mention in the Mass. As the names of some were recited in the canon, the word canonize came to, to designate the act of entering such and such a one's name in the liturgical list. And saints whose names were so entered were said to be canonized. At least those whose names are in the Mass ought to be familiar to all, not by name only, but also by their lives. Who they were, when they lived, how they fought the good fight, kept the faith, loved Christ, and are now enjoying eternal happiness in the presence of God. To communicate with them means conferring with them, putting our life in sweet accord with theirs, using our will and intention to get in touch with them, as we would do with our friends and companions. Not the pen or wire, but prayer is the medium between us, the senders, and the saints, the receivers. Impart your cares to them, communicate your hopes, dreams and desires, calculations, problems, that you may see their influence bring to bear their intercession uh, in your behalf. How probable to grasp the character of these important personages. The better we know them, the more apt we are to go to them. In the past, Catholics in certain places of Europe used to pray to their pa special patrons and put certain saints in the list. But the list we use is the one used in Rome most of the saints on it being Roman. That is, they lived in Rome sometime or other. Well, may our knees be imparted to these heavenly petitioners. They are the saints of the drama of our religion to whom our Lord has given leading parts. And for this reason, they are commemorated in the fixed portion of this liturgy. Nor us how the names of the 12 murderers follow the 12 apostles. It is like a short litany but it ends up, ends up with and, and all the saints. These we ask to intercede for us, to beg God to apply their merits to our souls that we may reap the richest fruits of the Mass. The Church commends them, for, them to us for consideration, bids us to make their acquaintance. And no time is more suitable than the present for a study of those canonized saints, their lives and times. Look them up in the Catholic Encyclopedia. 
What we should do, be doing it all through life, is learning more about these saints of God, the world's greatest heroes. The next part, the Hunky Tour and the Quam Oblazioni. <clears throat> On beginning the Hunky Tour, the priest spreads his hands over the oblation so that the tips of his fingers reach as far as the middle of the palm. Then the bell is rung once. At the conclusion of the prayer, he rejoins his hands and draws them towards himself, saying the laquam oblationem. The oblations are blessed, three crosses being made over the host and chalice, followed by one cross over the host and the other above the chalice, all done with the right hand while the left rests on the altar. He next joins his hands and bows his head at the sacred name with which the blessing ends. Tour in English says, We therefore beseech thee, O Lord, graciously to accept this oblation of our service, as also of thy whole family, and to dispose our days in thy peace. Preserve us from eternal damnation, and rank us in the number of thine elect, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, long tour, these are Latin words with which the fourth prayer of the Church of the Canon begins. During the Hunky Tour, the priest, who joined his hands at the conclusion of the preceding prayer through the same Christ our Lord, Amen, spreads them over the offerings at this time. The imposition of hands was introduced, as Monsignor Moorman explains, as a way of practically touching the sacrifice at this point, at which it is so definitely made in the prayer. Now, in the old law, the priest spread out his hands over the head of the victim, the setting apart for the altar. The victim burdened with the sins of the people and substituted in the place of sinners. Now this ceremony also symbolizes that Christ, who soon become present under the appearances of bread and wine, is the expiatory victim, making satisfaction for our sins. In this prayer, we send to heaven three fervent petitions, namely for peace on earth, deliverance from eternal punishment, and admission to eternal happiness. These favors we ask of God through Christ, firstly, who for us was betrayed into the hands of those who hated peace, secondly, who for us was condemned to death on the cross, and thirdly, who for us was numbered among the wicked. With hands spread out over the oblation, the priest recites the hunky jitur, that is, we therefore beseech thee, O Lord, and so on. And it's customary to ring the bell at this point to remind the people of the nearness of the consecration, so that they may await the coming of the Lord with due reverence and devotion. The quam oblationa. Next, the priest makes the sign of the cross five times over the offering. English translation, which oblation do thou, O God, while shape in all respects to make blessed, approved, and ratified, reasonable, and acceptable, that it may be made for us the body and blood of the most beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, at the conclusion of the preceding prayer, the priest joins his hands and then recites the prayer beginning with the words, quam oblationa, that is, which oblation, and so on. This is the last prayer the priest says before the consecration. And the nearer he approaches that, that to that moment, the more interesting his words become. In the preceding prayer, the priest asks Almighty God to accept the oblation. He now proceeds with the words, which oblation do thou, O God, and so on. <coughs> we pray first that this oblation be blessed. That is, it may be it may, be, it may, by the divine benediction, be changed into a more normal substance. Secondly, that it may be approved, not rejected as were in some cases the sacrifices of the, of the old law. And thirdly, that it may ra be ratified, that is, accomplished, and made a pure and spotless 
offering. Fourthly, that it may be reasonable, that is, as St. Augustine exclaims, differing from all the sacrifices of irrational creatures, as were those of the old law. <clears throat> Acceptable it must be when it becomes the body and blood of his well-beloved son by the words of consecration. And during his recitation of this prayer, the priest makes the sign of the cross five times over the offering. The remembrance of the fact that the sacrifice now about to be consummated derives its virtue completely from the sacrifice on the cross. Three times the sign of the cross is made over both species together, and then separately over the bread and the chalice. These signs give emphasis to the words of the prayer. The first three signs we are reminded of the Blessed Trinity, in which source the blessing of the consecration is to be poured out upon the elements of bread and wine. <coughs> the fivefold signing of the cross before and after the consecration also reminds us of the five wounds so conspicuous on the body of Christ. We'll continue next month on the remaining parts of the Holy Sacrifice. Amen. May the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.